Welcome everyone, and I wish you a good morning. Today's talk will be Soils in the Home Vegetable Garden, and the presenter will be Birgit Evans. Birgit has grown her own food on a large scale for the past 30 years and has created a successful garden and nursery business. She is passionate about growing and raising food and seeks to encourage and educate others so they can also share the benefits of fresh, healthy, homegrown food. She grows vegetables in four different Alameda County gardens and starts 90% of her plants from seed. She has been an Alameda County Master Gardener since 1999 and was on the advisory board for 14 years, including three terms as president. She has taught classes on a variety of topics for the Master Gardeners of Alameda County for 20 years, both to the public and uh, for Master Gardener training classes. She has also been on the board of Alameda Backyard Growers since 2013 and is currently the treasurer. Birgit, you may start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy, for that kind introduction. So we are going to um, talk about home soils and let's take it away. Uh, University of California, um, Master Gardeners, we, our mission is to um, extend UC research-based information to home gardeners. And that would be you guys. Okay, so we're gonna talk about some soil basics. To grow a great garden, first you've gotta have great soil. And I always like to say that dirt is destiny. Uh, the quality of your soil is going to determine how well your plants grow. It's going to help prevent diseases. And it's just going to make a world of difference. If you do not have good soil, your plants are going to be struggling. So first of all, we're going to talk about what is soil, the types of soil, and then we're going to talk about how to build and maintain some healthy soil. So according to, according to the University of California Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources, which is who the master gardeners work under, Soil is the loosely arranged mineral or organic material on the immediate surface of the earth that serves as a natural medium for the growth of land plants. So everything that we're gonna be talking about today is probably the top eight inches to maybe two to three feet for some really deep soils that cross the, the, the land area of our planet. And that's, that is where almost everything happens. So soil has got four components. Um, I, this is ideally, ideally you want your soil to have 45% mineral matter, which would be composed of sand, silt, or clay particles. You ideally would like 5% organic matter and then 50% pore space. And you would like that pore space to be evenly divided, 25% air and 25% water for reasons that we will see in coming slides. So mineral matter, you've got different kinds of mineral matter. So sandy soil has got a really large, large mineral particles. You know, like when you take sand at the beach and you run it through your fingers. And when you add water to sandy soil, you get this V-shaped profile that you see here on the left. Loamy soil, this is that mythical loamy soil, the perfect soil for growing plants that so few people around the world actually have. And that's a lovely combination of sand, silt, and clay soils, evenly mixed. And it creates this sort of bowl-shaped uh, profile, water profile. Clay soil is what most people in Alameda County have. It's got very small mineral particles and it creates sort of this disc shaped um, water, and sort of bowl shaped water, um, water profile. So it can look like you can water and it can sort of look like you 
watering deeply, but really most of the water has just sort of spread out on the surface. So mineral matter, what, type, what kind of particles you have determines the type and texture of the topsoil that you've got. So sandy soil has got large particles. It warms much faster in the spring. It's easier to dig. It's not gonna break your pitchfork because it does not compact. It's not able to compact. It's got large pores, so it holds lots of air, but it's got large pores, so it doesn't hold a lot of water. And it also has a low nutrient storage capacity. So when you add water, or when you add fertilizer, they tend to leach out of the sandy soil. Clay soil has very small particles, which bind together and it stays cooler in the springtime, tends to compact when it's wet. Um, anybody who's dug sand and clay soil knows that it's a real bear to, to, to dig. It doesn't have a lot of air pockets that will hold oxygen, but it does hold more water. And this is a huge bonus of clay soil. It has a really high nutrient content. So if you can just do a little bit with your clay soil, you have a lot of the nutrients that you're gonna need for your plants. Then turning to that 5% of your soil that is organic matter. So what is that composed of? Well, it's really complicated. And I, I put this really complicated um, graphic in here because it's really complicated. So there are the things that you would expect. There are plant roots, there's all that dec decaying plant matter, the leaves and the grasses, et cetera, from your prior crops. And then there are the things you think of like earthworms. But a cubic inch of soil contains literally billions of organisms, of healthy soil contains billions of organisms. So it's got, a lot of um, algae, bacteria, fungi, and these things do different things. So you can have de decomposer bacteria and fungi which help to break down plant matter. You have synergistic mutualists, and these are bacteria and fungi that actually work synergistically with the roots of the plants, and they form um, relationships and they will actually help your plants to absorb water and to absorb nutrients. You've got pathogens, uh, which promote disease. And then you've got things that feed on all of these different um, bacteria, fungi, nematodes. So you've got root feeders, you've got bacterial feeders, and you've got fungal feeders. So basically it's an entire ecosystem going on in that cubic inch of your soil. You also have some larger organisms, like we mentioned the earthworms and then macroarthropods that actually break down organic matter in your soil. And they um, provide habitat for the bacteria in their guts and in their fecal pellets. And you've got higher level predators, nematode feeding nematodes, and then the things we think of, mice, voles, shrews, birds, and they help to, um, controlled populations of other organisms, but they also improve soil structure with their burrowing and their passing soil through their guts. Benefits of good soil structure. So having good soil is really important. It will hold both water and air better. Remember the sand doesn't hold water and the clay doesn't hold air. But if you improve your soil structure, they will each hold what they're missing right now a lot better. Good soil drains well. Um, it improves the habitat for those soil organisms, which then work synergistically with your plant roots. And it has good tilt. And tilt is defined as the fitness of a medium for growing plants and other organisms. How to build and maintain healthy soil. So if you've heard about the benefits, now let's learn how to do it. Practice sustainable gardening. So you wanna try and mimic nature as much as you can. So you wanna add some compost to your soil. You wanna keep the soil covered with mulch. 
that is my front garden and basically all the leaves that have fallen back here underneath the mulberry bush and onto the rest of the garden, I leave a layer of those on the garden. Um, I don't feel any need to remove them because they will actually protect the soil and break down. You want to avoid compaction. So in your vegetable garden, you want to have distinct pathways and beds. I grow in the ground, but I have distinct pathways that I walk on so that I'm not walking on my beds. You want to avoid disturbance um, as we are trying to work out how to get the carbon out of our atmosphere and back into the soil. We are discovering that the more you till the soil, the more you turn it, the more you let that carbon that the, has been sequestered in the soil back out into the atmosphere. So unless you have large trees full of roots, which I do, if you can get away with not tilling your soil, that's great. And that leads us to the next one, which is avoid disturbance, especially rototilling. Rototilling really disrupts everything in your soil and it can really damage the tilt of your soil. Consider adding a cover crop. A uh, cover crop is something that you would plant in the off season. You, there are summer cover crops and there are winter cover crops. And you would put those in there and they will um, add carbon. You, you add something that has a legume for nitrogen and then uh, some, a grain, which will provide carbon. You till those in and that will actually help um, improve your soil. You wanna minimize pesticide use. Pesticides tend to be very broad spectrum. So they kill a whole bunch of things, um, including in your soil. And they tend to have a lot of unintended consequences. So it's better to practice integrated pest management where you correctly identify what the problem is and then see if there's a least toxic way to get rid of that problem. And you really don't want to over fertilize. If you add fertilizer, we'll, we'll see as we look at nutrients. If you add too much of one chemical, you can reduce the availability of other important nutrients. And also additional fertilizer will just run off into the waterways and it will create um, dead zones, which is what we see when all the runoff from the farms runs down the Mississippi River and there are big dead zones in the Gulf of, um, or I'm sorry, in the Caribbean, whatever ocean that is. <laughs> okay, why use compost? Um, compost returns nutrients to the soil. All your plants pulled a whole bunch of nutrients out of, the, uh, out of your soil as they were growing. And so it's really important to return those nutrients back to the soil. Compost replenishes soil organism populations. It gives them food. It gives them something to feed on and to break down. Compost creates soil structure. So if you've got clay soil, it opens up some air pockets. If you've got sandy soil, it helps to hold water. It reduces soil erosion, improves the air exchange, keeps your water on site, and improves drainage. So there's a study that the National Resources Defense Council put out and that has been confirmed as being correct that for every 1%, you increase your soil organic matter, your soil can hold an additional 20,000 gallons per acre. We are in a drought. We are in year two of a fairly severe drought. So the more organic matter you can add to your soil, the less you should need to water because the water you do put in will be retained better. Compost is really easy to make. And it can be done in a million different ways. There are, many there are as many ways to make compost as there are people making compost. And even the master gardeners have completely different ways of making it. That, um, that messy looking pile on the left, that is my compost pile. It is 26 years old now. And I just take the big parts and put it into the put it into the new compost. So I think we can say that it's been running for 26 years now, continuously. And then this is the Master Gardener Trials Garden. And we have three different bins here. So we put all the new, we chop. Um, you can barely see the little block here. 
We actually use a machete. It's great for getting at your aggressions to chop down the plant material. And then we layer it in with straw and let it cook. Then we turn it into the middle bed and let it do its main cooking. And then we move it over here to the third box and there it cools down and we strain it out and we harvest it and we take the uncomposted bits and we turn them around and put them back into box number one. Decay happens. So as long as you have some water, you could just pile up all your, your garden waste into a corner in your yard and just leave it there and eventually it will break down. It may take a while, but it would break down. So we generally want our compost a little bit faster than that. So to help it along, you're gonna do a few things. You're gonna try and make your compost pile half carbon and half nitrogen. So nitrogen is all the green material, uh, the grass, your green weeds that you're harvesting, the broccoli plant that you just pulled out so you're going to put those in. You can chop them down, as I mentioned, that'll make your composting go faster. Or you can just leave them whole. I tend to be a lazy gardener and I tend to leave things whole and they just break down on their own. It takes a little bit longer. And then your browns, your browns are all of your dried materials. So your dried leaves, I tend to collect them in bags in the fall when they're readily available. And then I have them, redwood, pine needles, um, just anything that's dry and brown. You need a space big enough to hold either that series of boxes or a couple of different compost piles because you need to move the, you need to turn the compost to get air into it. You're gonna want a pitchfork and a rake you cannot get a shovel into compost as it's going. You need a pitchfork. Um, right tools for the job will make your life so much happier. And you need a compost thermometer. This is a big, it's very, it's very long. It's like 12, 18 inches long. And so the end of it sticks way down into the compost and you can tell how hot your compost is going. Mine, it looks there, it looks like it's about 90 degrees. That's Probably I'm usually in the 90 to 110 degree range. 140 degrees will kill weed seeds. So if you really want, you've got a lot of weed seeds in what you're putting in and you really need them killed, then you're gonna to wanna to chop down your material and you're gonna to wanna to turn every two to three days to really keep that heat up there and intense. And then you need something to cover it. Um, you can use, I use burlap sacks because they're a little bit more organic. But then I had a sheet of plastic, of like really super thick plastic that I wasn't doing anything else with. And instead of just tossing it, I used it for about, lasted about six, seven years. And that will keep the, the moisture in your pile. And it will also in the wintertime keep it from getting way too waterlogged. So chop your materials for faster composting or just throw them all in. That's, the, that's my fava bean crop after I was done with it. Um, it broke down, took a little bit longer. Add alternate layers of greens and browns. So I'm going to top those fava beans with a layer of brown material. And then I'm going to add a layer from the compost pile back here. And so I'm going to alternate. I will do green, brown, compost. Make your pile at least three by three by three. That's sort of the minimum size that you can get for it to really heat up properly. Anything that's smaller than that and it has a little difficulty heating. You can make it a lot larger than that too. It just depends on what you've got and how much you want to turn. Oops, sorry. Wet your pile. Uh, you need it to be as wet as a wrung out sponge. Sometimes you can pour water through. Sometimes I will just have a little sprinkler in there and I'll put it, I'll just keep moving the sprinkler up as I add the layers. And then you need to turn your pile. So as you, as you see the number on the compost thermometer go down, you need to turn the pile. So the, this is my two spaces. So this will heat 
and then it'll get turned over. Th this will be incorporated into this. And then as this starts to cool, it'll go back over here. And then I just keep turning it back and forth between the two places. When your compost is done, you'll start to see a lot of broken down material. It'll be, it'll be pretty fine. I like some pieces, I like some parts in there. Um, I don't like it broken down too much. I like to give my soil organisms a chance to do some more of the breakdown. So when it's done, strain it through a quarter inch hardware cloth. So you can see all the strain, the finished compost has come through here. And then everything that is not finished is up here. And that's just gonna be poured right back into the compost pile. I might pull out some of these sticks and things that don't look like they're actually ever gonna break down, but the rest of this will just go back into the compost pile. Add, so you've now got your finished compost. Add one to two inches of compost to your vegetable beds every time you replant. So as I pull out my broccoli plants later today and I go to plant squash, I'm gonna put in about a good one to two inches of compost and some fertilizer into the bed where I'm going to plant those. And that will help to um, make my soil viable for squash, which is another broccoli and squash are both heavy feeders. So I need to be really careful that I give them enough nutrients so that they can grow well. If you have trees or perennial beds, you can top dress with compost. You don't need to dig it in. You can just top dress the beds with compost once or twice a year, and that will help to build soil um, in those beds as well. Nutrients and fertilizer. We've alluded to adding um, fertilizer to the soil. So there are 17 essential plant nutrients. The first three carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, those are taken up from air and water, which is why you need to have the 25% air, 25% water in those soil pores. Then there are the primary nutrients, which are flipped backwards here by our beloved master gardeners. So it's NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And those are your three big ones. When you read a soil, when you read the numbers on a fertilizer bag, when it says 772, that means 7% 7 by dry weight nitrogen, 7% 7 by dry weight phosphorus, 2% by dry weight potassium. Those are always the same, it's always NPK. Then you have your secondary nutrients, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, and you have your micronutrients, boron, chlorine, copper, iron, manganese, molybdenum, nickel, and zinc. And most California soils are deficient in nitrogen. So when you're growing heavy feeders, like a lot of vegetable crops, you absolutely do need to add nitrogen, even though you're adding compost. Compost is not necessarily really high in nutrients because a lot of those nutrients were taken up to break down the organic matter. You're probably also gonna to have to add phosphorus. And in some soils, you're also gonna to need to add potassium. Many soils are missing other nutrients. So there are trace mineral uh, fertilizers. Azomite is a brand, brand name of one. And it, I think it represents A to Z is what they're trying to say there. It's a made up name. Um, but there are other trace mineral fertilizers too. It's also really important not to over fertilize for the reasons we talked about. You know, excess fertilizer will leach out into the soils. But also, I'm not sure if you can see it on the slide, but things like calcium and manganese or magnesium and manganese are and nickel, zinc are all plus two cations. That means they have two extra protons that are looking to bind with electrons and they will take each other's places in molecules. So if you have too much magnesium in the soil, it can cause a deficiency of manganese, nickel, and zinc because there's not enough 
molecules to bind with the manganese, nickel, and zinc. So you need to be careful that you're not over fertilizing. What about mulch? Mulch is basically anything used to cover the soil. Organic mulches will are ideally will decompose slowly and they'll increase your soil organic matter. Inorganic mulches are a little bit more problematic, um, rocks and things like that in various sizes. This picture up here is obviously not a vegetable garden. Uh, the difficulty is this, this, this mulch is very attractive and it's preventing any weeds from coming up. However, there is no, it's not gonna add anything to your soil. It's not gonna add any organic matter to your soil. And the, the soil underneath mulches like this tends to be overheated. And because the gardener figures they don't need to actually add any water, probably most of the soil organisms have died because they do need water to survive. So try and stay away from, from rock mulches because they just don't really ultimately benefit your plants. Um, mulches will prevent soil erosion. Okay. Benefits of mulching prevent compaction. They prevent soil compaction that we talked about. They will reduce weeds. They're a really great way to reduce weeds. Um, and since weeds are competing with your plant for soil moisture, that's a really good deal. They will insulate roots. As our summers get hotter, it's important to keep our roots cool and a thick layer of mulch will help when it's 100 degrees out to insulate the roots. And they will also help to conserve moisture in that soil so that you don't have to do as much watering. And ultimately they will break down and the straw will be incorporated into the soil. And hopefully, you know, between crops, maybe a little bit of it will be dug into that soil to help build some more organic matter. There are different types of mulch. There is the straw bale. Uh, we use at the Lake Merritt Trials Garden, we use a lot of straw, like a very loose, light um, covering of straw to mulch. You can also get yard waste. This is our chat monitor, Irene, sitting on a giant compost of a pile of yard waste. And then there are the bark mulches. So if you're gonna use um, a compo composite mulch, try and use some of something like this yard waste rather than a fur bark mulch because that has different sized part pieces. It is uh, made up of different things, including wood, all of which will break down into your soil and add to that soil organic matter. Fur bark mulches, when you think about bark, what is bark designed to do? It's designed to protect the tree. So it's got chemicals in it designed to deter insects and organisms. It's also designed not to break down. The tree it would be a bad thing for the tree if it's mulch just broke down in the presence of water. So, or if it's bark just broke down in the presence of water. So you, that they also tend to be, if you can see, these are all similarly sized pieces, which means they don't lock together and they don't hold in place over your soil. Tends to wash off, tends not to break down and doesn't really add a lot to your soil. If it does break down, it's adding chemicals to deter growth. So try and stick a, stay away from bark mulches or see if you can get um, a lot of the chipper shredder companies, uh, the tree companies will be able to deliver piles of mulch like this. Although maybe not quite this much. Irene obviously had a large space there. Um, one more thing, this is not vegetable gardens, but it's important enough that I wanted to add it in here. When you are applying mulch to a tree or a shrub or another plant, you do not want to cover over the base of the plant. You want to be able to see the crown of the plant right here. And you want your mulch to be out here near the drip line and if anybody knows, this is the drip line of the tree. It's where most of the feeder roots are. 
So this is where you should fertilize, this is where you should water, is out where the feeder roots are, not right up against the trunk. And likewise, do not apply a really thick coating of mulch right there. And I think that is it for us. And I think we're in on good time. So we've got some time for some questions. And this is our resource list, which Irene will be putting into the chat. Okay, hang on one second, Birgit. Let me, there we go. Okay, we have actually quite a few questions and some really good ones. Okay, um, good. Let me start with, I'll start with compost since we did have quite a few. There were some questions on how to make compost. Mm -hmm. um, hang on one second. Um, there's one question about, uh, is it a good idea to keep dry leaves on the bottom of the, oh, I'm sorry. So I, I misinterpreted this as compost, but let me do it anyway. Is it a good idea to keep dry leaves on the bottom of, a, of the compost pile and add soil to it? I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I you know, oh. my, my compost is basically, it extends down into the soil. So it's sort of an interface with the soil. So I would hope that any dry leaves that you put down on the bottom of the compost pile would um, break down eventually. You can add dry leaves to the top of your soil and they'll break down. I, I, so yeah, I don't know that I would be digging up soil to put on top of leaves. What about eucalyptus waste as compost or mulch? Mm, that's a very good question. So there are certain things black walnut, which I, my neighbors have one, um, and eucalyptus. They're both allelopathic. They produce chemicals um, in their roots, in their leaves, in their bark that prevent other plants from growing underneath them. It's, it's their competition mm -hmm. stopper. And so be careful about using that. Sometimes when you order in um, from the from the chipper shredder people, a pile you can't tell whether there's eucalyptus in there or not. Um, hopefully, it's not all eucalyptus, because that would be a great thing to use where you don't want any plants to grow. But yeah, yeah, a little bit is okay in the compost pile, but large amounts, no. Pine needles are another thing. Pine needles and eucalyptus tend to be a little acidic. And so if you already tend to acidic soil, limit their use in the um, in your compost pile. Okay, thanks, Birgit. Is it um is there a good commercial compost to use uh, while you're waiting to produce your own? Yeah, see if you can get something that says it's organic, although most of them tend to be organic. Check out what you know, check out what it says is in there. Um, you can also go to the Davis Street Transfer Station. They've got a lot of organic compost in bulk that you can buy. You can have it delivered. Um, there are certain companies, I'm not allowed to mention names, Davis Street is because it's a, it's a civic organization, nonprofit. Um, but you can have it delivered in bulk. Look for something organic. Ask to see what the final product actually looks like. There's one organic compost or organic, supposedly organic company um, whose compost basically looks like chip tre chipped trees and, gro <laughs> and grows mushrooms. I did not believe it when somebody came in and showed it to me one time. This, these are the mushrooms growing in my compost. Are you kidding me? So make sure that it's fairly well broken down by the time you get it and maybe ask to take a look at what it looks like. You want it to be um, pretty well broken down, dark, rich, um, and organic, so. Okay, any, recommend, any recommendations for compost for clay soils? Add it, 
at as much as you can. If you are starting, <laughs> I mean, you know, get a, get a good quality compost. That's the same for whatever soil. That's my recommendation for whatever soil you've got. But um, if you're starting out with clay and you've got an, you're facing an entire backyard full of weeds and clay soil, my recommendation is that you take a look around, look for your very best sunlight where you can also get water brought to, out to it, where you can easily access it with irrigation. And pick a, I don't know, four by eight piece of land and start working that and take your weeds off. You may still be able to get them before they go to seed at this point and build them into a compost pile. And if you build that compost pile on another weed covered area, you can also, um, get rid of the weeds there too because they will die underneath the compost but use those build your compost pile and then start working the soil I would bring in if I'm working with brand new clay soil probably about six inches of compost um, you want to work it when it is damp but not soggy never work clay soil when it's soggy you will destroy the till and once it's gone it's not coming back in your lifetime. So um, mix in probably about six inches or so. And then once you've got that done, if you feel like you can tackle more of the yard, tackle another small block and just tackle it piece by piece. If you try and dig up the entire yard all at once, you're going to give up and walk away. And here's a follow-up on the same clay soil question. Um, how do you add or mix in compost to clay soil without tilling? Oh, you're going to have to dig. Okay, so so the no tillage idea with the um, uh, which is the new big carbon thing that assumes that you've got soil where the plant roots can penetrate other than weed plant roots. Um, so if you're dealing with heavy clay soil that has not been amended or worked with or where all the organic matter has just been stripped off it by the mow and blow crew for decades, you really are going to have to do tilling at least for the first few years. If you have trees, I have got that black walnut. I've also got another neighbor has a redwood tree and my soil is the only soil that's got water. So they're both sending out their roots like right into my garden. I till every single time that I plant and I pull out literally giant mounds. So no-till is lovely. It's a great option. If you're doing permaculture or permaculture guild, it's a really great option to just be able to add the organic matter to the top. But in reality, for small gardens where people have a lot of trees around them, it's not, it's not viable. And uh, a couple more on incorporating compost. Um, what they're asking, do you fold compost in before planting or place on top of existing soil around plants? And this also goes into somewhat, there was a question on mulch about whether you can use compost as mulch. Uh, so if, if you're going to go no-till, then you're going to add, or if you're planting around trees, bushes, shrubs, then yes, you're just going to top dress with the compost. Don't put it right up to the stem, up to the trunk or the stem, but yes, top dress with the compost. And then, um, what was the second one? Um, just, uh, can you use compost as mulch? Yes, you can use compost as mulch. Perfect. And one more along those lines is, should you top dress native plants, I'm assuming this is California native plants, with compost twice a year? You know what, I would. I, I would, um, because what we have done, the way we've treated our soil for the past probably 80 or 90 years, applying a lot of chemicals, literally taking every leaf out of the garden and removing it and sending it away somewhere, we've really depleted our soils of organic matter. So historically, all of those California natives would have dropped their leaves right underneath the plant and that would have gone into building up a lovely leaf litter. 
So you can either use compost, you could also potentially use leaves or leaf litter. And then the other thing to do um, is to not obsessively remove all the leaves in the garden. Um, it, may, it may not look like it goes in, in the Sunset Garden book, but really it is much more, um, it, it's much more Sunset Gardeny. <laughs> to, to actually leave some of your leaves down there um, unless there's a problem with disease unless you have for some reason the, the leaves are diseased they're full of the rose leaves are full of rust etc then you definitely want to remove them okay um moving on to a little bit it's uh, this is composty also but um our fungal net our fungal nets bad I got a fair bit while growing seedlings inside and the mulch I got also had fungal gnats. Um, things seem to be growing okay. Yeah, it depends because you saw in that slide that we had on the different organisms um, that fungi were pretty much in every single role. They're beneficial, they're pathogenic, they are eaten, they eat. Um, they pretty much do everything. And the problem is that we don't know a great deal about what they do. If your compost is producing large amounts of, of mushrooms, that pretty much means it hasn't been broken down well enough. Um, try and get something that's in a little bit further stage of decay next time um, and turn it into the soil where it's a little bit less um, concentrated. As long as your plants are growing well, though, I wouldn't worry about it. Birgit, I'm sorry. I missed that. That was great. Uh, you know, I appreciate that also. Yeah. But the, mm -hmm. the, I'm sorry. The, answer, the question was about the gnats. Gnats. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> See, I have here. I have hearing difficulty. No, sorry. no. I, so thank you for thank you for I, clarifying that for me. I have <laughs> I have speaking difficulty. So go right ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. That was that was my hearing. Fungal gnats. Yeah. Um, I don't know. If they're not hurting the plants, I'd leave them alone. They're part of the ecosystem too. You know, I, I'm not really sure what you could do about them short of applying something heavy duty, which is going to have unintended consequences. Okay, we have two questions about manure. Um, one person is asking, um, I'm beginning and I don't have compost yet. What should I add to the soil? Is cow manure good? And a second person asks, do you use manure? I use horse manure and it works great. You know, I have, when I first started my gardens, I went up to the stables and, and got those truckloads of horse manure. Um, the one thing you might ask about is, and, and I would consider this in, in both cow and horse manure, first of all, they have to be composted. They're too hot, they're too rich in nitrogen. Um, just plain about pretty much the only thing that doesn't need to be composted would be rabbit pellets if you have a friend who's got rabbits or anything like that um, but chicken cow horse it all needs to be composted the horse manure tends to come with a lot of bedding um, so it's coming straight out of stalls from a stable so it's mixed with bedding and when it arrives sometimes it's still really hot and steaming I think that if you turn it in with enough soil, it's fine. Um, you're gonna you're gonna dilute that. But the one thing to ask about is, um, I know that they medicate horses, and just mm. find out whether the horses or the cows have been medicated, and if so, with what, and is that going to be a problem in your organic soil? I'm going to interject my own question here. Yeah. Is um, Oakland Zoo has something called Zoo Do mm -hmm. that they, I believe they give away free. I'm not sure how it is now. Um, do you have any opinions on that? Again, I guess it would just be a matter of making sure that, that they're not medicating the animals with anything right. that might be toxic to, to just ask that question. Um, oh. But yeah, I believe they compost that. I don't think they they're do. just giving it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So sure. Another way to, to reuse. Anytime we can reuse rather than sending stuff away, it is a great deal. Okay, a couple of questions on fertilizing. Uh, should we follow the application quantity listed on the package 
or dilute slash reduce the amount? I would follow what it says on the package. Okay. And I'm recommending, I mean, most of what I use is about, if you're using an organic fertilizer, um, then it's going to be pretty slow release as it is, unless you're using something like fish emulsion or one of the foliar sprays, which are immediately available. So plan that way that if you are, um, if you're using organic fertilizer, it's not going to be immediately available to the plants. It may take, if it's a rock dust, it could take six months or so. Now, if you're continuously adding rock dust every time you plant, then the stuff from six months ago is now available to your current plants, and the stuff you're applying now will be available to your next crop in another six months. So, but just be mindful that even some of the things like blood meal can take four weeks, four to eight weeks to become available to the plants. Okay, just on a little announcement to everybody. We're coming up on noon. It's about uh, three minutes to noon. Um, we have a few more questions and I think Beer, could you can stay over a little bit? Of course. Of okay. Course. So we, yeah. we still have almost everybody here. So I assume that I'm cool. not boring. I'm boring. I'm not boring people to death. So let's you are Let's not. <laughs> oh, and there's some, the, some of these questions are really good. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, still on fertilizer. What about using alfalfa pellets for nitrogen supplement? Sure. I mean, if you don't have, I think they could be a little bit more expensive just because they're meant for as feed. Um, but yes, um, I'm trying to think, I believe rosarians use them a lot for roses and swear by them. Again, make sure it's organic alfalfa pellets. So you're not introducing anything to your soil. Okay, is, um, is pH monitoring a good measure of the quality of the soil? And if so, should you measure it initially or regularly? I would say measure it initially and then regularly. And it's part of some of the soil tests from some of the soil test labs. It's not going to tell you the entire health of your soil, but it is going to tell you certain things. Most vegetable crops want a pH between 5.5 and 7. So 7 being neutral. So they want to be slightly acidic, but not too acidic. And you, for lead purposes, want to be closer to that neutral. You want to be close to a 7. So it's a good idea to get that initial report back on what nutrients you have in your soil, what your soil pH is, and then you will know how to amend. So um, you can amend with lime or with sulfur to, to get yourself a little closer to a neutral pH. And also with compost, which will also help you to bring your soil close. So it, it's a good way to monitor your soil. It's a good way to monitor what you're doing and whether what you're doing is having an effect. And we have uh, one more comment here on mulch. And this is more of a comment uh, mm -hmm. that uh, folks need to be careful with straw uh, because they can have invasive grass seeds like I did when I bought straw bales. <laughs> okay, yes. So, so difference between straw and hay because a lot of people come in and they, then to nurseries and they're asking for hay. So hay is a carefully blended um, selection of grasses that are harvested just as they're starting to go to seed, just as they have like maximal nutrients and it's used for animal feed. So you never want to use hay on your, on your soil. Straw is when you grow wheat, the top is the wheat, the head of the wheat, and then down below the stem, that's the straw it is still gonna have some grains in it. So it could still have some rice or it could still have some wheat um, in there. Hopefully a high quality straw, they've taken off most of the grain because they wanted to harvest it and use it. Um, but yes, be careful because you will still get some stuff coming up. You should be able, it, it should be pretty easy to hoe that out though. Um, if you're getting a lot, then don't use that supplier again. Mm -hmm. Okay, and a couple of questions on uh, the lead section. Um, how hmm, far from the just house- Just a couple? <laughs> Actually, yeah, just a couple. You explained it perfectly. Okay. 
Uh, how far from the house should a vegetable garden be placed to avoid lead paint next to the house? I think probably a couple of feet would be good. You know, I would say two feet would be good. It, it really, it does not spread. The lead paint, you know, it, you, you can see where any chips have maybe fallen, but I would say two feet out should be good. You can get different sections of your soil tested too. So if the soil, you know, if you get a test two feet from your house where you're proposing to plant your vegetable garden, and then you get one further in the backyard, you'll be able to maybe get a, an idea of how much of the lead in your soil is actually from, um, from the lead paint. Another big source that we had until recently was lead in gasoline. And so that's how you get lead in places that are further away from your house. So if you see any place around where it looks like it was a dump, I live in a 1910 house. I used to rent a 1906 house. And at the back, there was a place where people were obviously had been dumping stuff, mm -hmm. various household bits and pieces. And I would be careful if you're seeing anything that's a dump that was obviously a dump about planting around there because who knows what they dumped out there. Uh, UMass, it's a soil testing uh, University of Massachusetts. UMass results for me say 41 parts lead per million. And they consider this moderate, which is way below your numbers. Am I reading this correctly? 40, 41 parts per million. Yeah, that's pretty low. Um, so, uh, historically, California soils had 75 parts per million. So I would say that was pretty low. Um, you might want to try, it has been suggested to me that UMass might not be the best for California soil. So you might want to try one of the labs on the, um, in the resources, the soil testing labs from California. They might give you a better analysis. Okay, now these are general um, general soil questions. Oops, hang on a second. Can I use last year's potting soil if I remove half of it and add fresh potting soil? Yeah, you know what I do every time I when you're when you're planting in containers or raised beds, you're get, you get leaching, and because it's, it's a much lighter mix. Um, sort of akin to, to, to a very sandy soil, because it's a much lighter mix. So every time you replant a container, you really need to add, I usually add compost. And then I add like, so like maybe three inches of compost or so. And then I add a couple of good handfuls, depending on the size of the container, of a mixed fertilizer, mixed organic fertilizer to the bed. So yeah, if, if we're talking about lowering carbon emissions and saving the planet, then taking that potting soil and just tossing it out, that's a huge waste. So I would say usually my soil level has gone down so I can just add that three inches of compost on the top and mix in some fertilizer and then replant. So yes, you can reuse your potting mix. Eventually you'll see that it sort of breaks down until it's like a really fine sort of almost nothing and then maybe add it to your garden soil. Well I'm glad you brought up raised beds because that's our next question yeah. is uh, what kind of soil to add to raised beds and where to get them or to get it the soil. Yeah I would have it there's there are a couple of places around here. Um, okay. Um, American soil, Acapulco are good for the North County. I do not know South or East County who to go to, um, but they can bring it in. They have raised bed mixes. You don't really want a potting soil because if you're gonna do a, a two to three foot tall raised bed, you need something that's sort of light, but you also need something that has got some body to it and some serious organic matter in it you're not looking for a potting soil in a, in a raised bed. So they will have raised bed mixes. 
and you can have them brought in um, by the cubic yard because these little teeny bags that you're buying for $10 a piece at the nursery, A, may not have exactly what you want, and B, are going to be really prohibitively expensive. You know, that is really the $10 tomato. <laughs> Yeah, seriously, it is. I mean, you know, to, to really be sustainable, um, that's a lot of resources to use. Plus, plus, you're throwing out a big piece of plastic for every two cubic feet of, of mix that you, you know, bought. So. And uh, this is the question that I thought was for compost, but apparently, I, I think this is more for. Um, uh, uh, potting soil and things, but mm -hmm. is it a good idea to keep dry leaves at the bottom of the pot was the question. I'm sorry, it was not the Oh, okay. Bottom of the pot and then add soil to it. You know, we had uh, Lauren Oki, one of our soils professors here at UC ANR, um, came out and gave a talk to us oh, in the way back, long, long time ago in my master gardening history. And what they did, they did a study where people thought that if you put rocks in the bottom of, of containers, it improved drainage. And they did a study and what they found was that, you know, if you've got the bottom of the pot and you put rocks in it, all you've done is raise the wet zone from the bottom of the pot up. So I don't know that it would particularly hurt to add a few leaves, but it, I don't know that it's really going to help a lot either. Okay, that's, that is it for the question.